Now this is the step-by-step -step for hydrological conditioning, the beginning step. And we're working with the topo to raster process. And we're using our original DEM, the DEM-03. Now this could be the DEM that you, uh, from your particular area, and I've got a hill shade showing. And I'm going to start uh, preparing the information I need for final processing. Now the first step is to take the original DEM, not the filled DEM, the original DEM and use the conversion tools from raster, raster to point, right? So we're turning the raster and that's our original DEM, we're turning that into a we're turning that into a uh, shape file, a point shape file, and that point shape file is what we'll be modifying in our topo to raster, and then it'll be moved back to a raster uh, in the very final step. So I've sent that out to the data file as a point, given it a point name, and I'm using the name or the original DEM so I can keep things straight, and then I go about processing that. While that's processing, I could take a look at that, and now it's complete, and I've got my point file. But while that was processing, I could have looked at the geoprocessing results and actually see that processing and see the little timer going. So now I've got a point file of my raster. I'm going to turn that off because it's, it's cluttering the screen. And now I'm going to take a look at the uh, topographic position index. I'm going to turn that on and look to see where the high locations and where the low locations are in the landscape from the tip. And I'm going to turn on my location, my dam location. Now these are the areas that I'm going to work on for my breaking my digital dams. Now they're now, when you're doing hydrological conditioning across a landscape, there could be thousands of these that you're working. We're just picking uh, four or five of them for this exercise. Now, in order to process, we need some addition, other layers for our topo to raster. So I'm in my required processing here. I'm going to put things in the right location so I can keep things straight. In the required processing layer, I'm going to add the, the appropriate ancillary data that I need because I need the contours and the boundary layer to, uh, to also be present for my, my processing. And I'll put those into the right places here just to keep things organized on the screen. And I'm, I'm uh, making the boundary layer uh, hollow just for, for ease, and I'm uh, I turn the contours and the boundaries off. Now what I need to do is in our catalog, we need to, uh, within our DEM condition, within our data file, we need to create a dam breaks. So we're going to add a new, and we're going to create a new shape file, and this new shape file we're going to call dam breaks, and it will be a polyline, and we're going to give it the correct coordinate system that's appropriate for our Minnesota LIDAR data, which is NAD83, UTM Zone 15. So we've got our dam breaks. And now the dam breaks I'm going to put in the right place here. So we've got... So things are organized. So now we're working on our creating this dam break process. So now we're going to digitize in these locations the um, the dam locations. I have to turn it on here. Uh, so that you can see and let's put the, the exploring below it so you can see the locations. Now, now we're going to zoom into these and create our uh, our dam breaks or breaches. Now to do that, it's helpful to have the TPI turned on, so we're going to create a line that connects. Now we want to make sure we connect downstream. So we're going to turn editing on, we're going to start editing, we're going to want to make sure we're doing our dam breaks, is what we're using, and that we've got our, let's clean up our screen here, and let's turn uh, in our editor, we want our editing window create features, so our dam breaks is going to be our uh, tool here. 
Let's move it so we can see. So we're selecting our dam brakes. You'll see that it's a poly line, straight line segment. And we, we start on the upstream and we go to the downstream. Now you'll notice that I'm digitizing below 1 to 2,000 and I'm trying to be as, as perpendicular as I can to the, to the contour uh, lines that uh, are, exist in the, in the landscape. So some of this is good background. Now for each one of these locations I've zoomed in and from the upstream to the downstream I've traced in those dam breaks. You can see the dam breaks and I've tried to be as perpendicular to the contour and, uh, and not digitize beyond the TPI, the bottom of the stream. So I've, I've done the minimum amount of, of uh, digitizing. Now we'll want to save this layer, stop editing, and save our save our. Now we want to actually do the topo to raster. Now the topo to raster is part of the Arc toolbox, and it's in spatial analyst, interpolation, topo to raster, or it's up under uh, 3D analyst tools in raster interpolation, topo to raster. Doesn't matter which one you use; they're the same. And they're based on algorithms that Dr. Michael Hutchinson developed at the Australian National University that's part of a, uh, a separate software package, the ANUDEM, and that portions of it have been included uh, by Esri in the, main, um, in the main ArcGIS product. And in order to do this, we're going to add our three layers, our boundary, our dam breaks, and our, the DEM that's been changed into points. Right? And we're going to be using the proper fields here, our boundary. We're going to be using the, as a boundary field. All right. And then type and our dam breaks, we're going to be calling that a stream. Right? And on our points are our point elevation. Then it's important on the, the point elevation to make sure we're using the right value, the grid code. And then in our output, we're going to want to be directing that to the to a, a proper subfolder where we're keeping our iterations separate. Because the process of, of hydrological conditioning is a series of steps. And often that you would go through and, and break the obvious uh, uh, dams, digital dams, and then you would go inspect it in the field and talk to stakeholders and come back and do it. It could be many different times with many different dam breaks, and so you want to keep those iterations separate. Now I call it DEM03 Hydro 1 Save. Now I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the other. Now we're using an output cell size of 3. That might confuse you a little bit. Our original DEM was, an, was a 3 meter DEM. The uh, Minnesota LiDAR data is delivered at a 1 meter. We're doing it at 3 just for efficiency and processing. Uh, it it uh, doesn't really matter, it just takes longer. Uh, we're taking the defaults in this operation, but you'd want to review those and look through the defaults. The important thing is the environments, that we're, we're, uh, we're properly locating our workspace, where our data, our scratch space, our output coordinates, as well as uh, the, and the output coordinates is um, the UTM, and then we're working with our processing extent, which is really quite important. We've talked about this before. The processing extent it would be the same as the DEM03, our original, and then our snap raster is DEM03. So we want everything to line up. So the grid cells, the three meter grid cells of all the different derived layers need to line up. So then at that point we're going to say OK for our processing uh, to process our three layers. Um, and that and you can see the, the as we move back up to the top here, the processing of our three layers, and we're going to uh, hit OK. Now while it's processing, you could take a look up in the geoprocessing results, and you could see that that it's running, it has the little timer here and that you'd be able to get an idea. It's not done yet, so everything's empty, but you could look at the inputs tab to see what input you used for that iteration. You could also see your environments, uh, which would tell you where the output is going, and, uh, and those sorts of things. So it's a very useful 
to examine that while this process is running and this could take five or ten minutes. Now when this is done we want to make sure that it's stretched just as we did in the DEM display uh, uh, section and we're doing the DEM display uh, in symbology in stretched rather than classified and we're using the uh, fairly simple colors in the ArcGIS uh, DEM sort of world. Okay, and we're setting up as two. Okay, so we've got uh, our now conditioned uh, DEM, at least based on our first iteration. And what we're going to want to do is derive a hill shade from this, just as we've done before. And so we're deriving a hill shade using the surface hill shade and we'll use our and we'll name it and we'll put it in our output called Hydro One Hill Shade using the defaults and we want to make sure we're using the Z factor we're not converting from feet we're using the Z factor of one so we can get a hill shade and you remember what we did before is we had the the information on the hill shade uh, coming through the DEM so we'll put the, the DEM above that and make that transparent so the hill shade comes through that. Again, this is a matter of choice whether the hill shade shows through the DEM or the DEM shows through the hill shade. But you get an idea now that we've broken that digital dam. And if I zoom out a little bit and just turn on the, the hill shade, you can see that we've broken that digital dam or breach that and if we compare that to our earlier hill shade uh, you can see that that we we have the dam in that case and in this case we've we've broken that digital dam so that's the process and now we're able to actually have water flow through the barriers that the lidar had um, incorrectly un, uh, interpreted in the landscape. Uh, those um, areas, for example, culverts that exist under a road that the LIDAR couldn't see. This completes our exercise.